Hello everyone, it's Professor Hall and I'm hoping to uh, chat with you a little today because you're reading this week uh, one of my favorite theorists, Mikhail Bakhtin, and I wanted to share uh, some of my thoughts about um, why I like him so much and how he might be useful in your thinking uh, in Ed 140 this semester. So um, Mikhail Bakhtin is a very famous um, philosopher of language. He joins uh, some others we've read this semester to um, comprise the theoretical component of our course, that is the big ideas from big thinkers who help us frame our work, who give us starting points for studying language literacy and meaning making. So if we think back on the course to others we've read uh, who come to mind as, as big thinkers, as important theorists, one person I remember is Paulo Freire, um, who is associated, of course, with ideas about um, how we can get past banking educations and how we can help students learn to read the world as well as read the word. So we associate Freire, of course, with uh, notions of, of a critical take on literacy. Another important theorist who comes to mind from the semester is Lev Vygotsky. And you'll remember, of course, that we associate Vygotsky with the notion of the zone of proximal development, the space where we can be greater than our actual uh, performance in a given moment. We can have our potential expanded um, through the social nature of learning um, by being assisted um, by others to do things we can't do our, on our own um, at a particular time. So in this way, um, Bygotsky um, helps us imagine how to expand potential um, teaching in that sweet spot called the zone of proximal development, or the zope. And then finally, another thinker who comes to mind as influential um, is James G., who um, you'll remember from the very first week of the semester when we thought about discourses and the ways in which literacy uh, can be viewed as a secondary discourse. So all of these thinkers, and others as well, um, are important in terms of giving us big ideas to frame our studies of language literacy and meaning making. And as you think about uh, creating a case study, which will be your last major um, assignment this semester, you'll want to think about uh, which of these theorists, um, Vygotsky, Bakhtin, G, or others, um, best could introduce your work, best could help you um, hone in on particular ideas that you could then explore uh, in some detail in your case study. But more about that later. But let's turn now to think a little about um, Bakhtin. I want to try to give you a sense of, of um, why I think he's so special and um, why his, his words resonate with me so much. His words are difficult. Um, the, the short excerpt that you had to read um, may have struck you as full of jargon and, and kind of hard to parse. That's partly because it's translated from the Russian, like Vygotsky. Um, Bakhtin um, grew up in the Soviet Union. In fact, they, they lived at about the same time. They didn't know each other. Uh, while Vygotsky um, was mostly interested in development, in child development and societal development, Bakhtin um, was a theorist of language, and he gives us very provocative, I think, um, ways to um, think about language that are relevant now, even in our world of, of remix. So uh, when I think of Bakhtin, the one of the first ideas that comes to mind is the notion of heteroglossia, which means exactly what it sounds like, means many-tongued. He was fascinated with the way that that language um, is multiple, it's diverse. Um, he, he thought about the ways in which not only we live among different languages like Spanish or French or English or Tagalog, but different forms of language. He was interested in uh, different dialects, um, different languages associated with different professions, um, um, different versions of the academy speak different languages, different regions speak different languages, and he called all of this diversity um, 
heteroglossia. Um, he was also interested, um, as, he, as he unpacked um, heteroglossia, um, to, to think about the ways in which these different languages, which are embedded in Jim G's sense in discourses, how all of these languages and discourses bump up against each other, come in conflict with each other, um, embody values that might be um, oppositional. So for Bakhtin, um, learning a language or becoming um, enculturated in a discourse was not an easy, simple um, matter. Rather, it was fraught with difficulty, um, uh, threaded through with power relations, and require some effort um, on the part of, <clears throat> of language learners to, to actually uh, join a discourse community. So I want to read you um, a couple of passages and, and point out um, um, a couple of pieces in the reading that you had that I think would repay your, your close attention. Um, the first passage is on page 75 of the reading that you had for this week. And in it, um, Bakhtin um, gives a good um, illustration of, of what he means by heteroglossia. This is at the top of page 75. Um, and he, he characterizes the hetero, he, he characterizes language development by saying it has both centripetal and centrifugal forces, forces that try to unify it and forces that try to pull it apart. Those centrifugal forces are the forces of heteroglossia. So he says, at any given moment of its evolution, language is stratified not only into linguistic dialects in the strict sense of the, of the word, <clears throat> according to formal linguistic markers, especially phonetic, but also, and for, this, for us this is the essential point, into languages that are socio-ideological, languages of social groups, professional and generic languages, languages of generations, and so forth. From this point of view, literary language itself is one of those heteroglot languages, and in its turn, it's also stratified into languages. And this stratification, or heteroglossia, once realized, is not only a static invariant of linguistic life, but also what ensures its dynamic stratification and heteroglossia widen and deepen as long as language is alive and developing. So he gives us the sense that we are, um, we're almost bombarded by different discourses and languages that are always growing and changing that represent um, different historical moments and professions and, and locations and dialects and genres. Um, and they're all, um, in a sense, in, in, in conflict with one, with one another. That notion of conflict, by the way, is one thing that separates Vygotsky and Bakhtin. Um, I like to think of Vygotsky as a, as a happy user of symbols. He had great faith in, in the power of language, in, in particularly in the power of writing, which he thought of as a special psychological tool um, to help us learn and to change our consciousness. Bakhtin, uh, on the other hand, was very fascinated with the ways in which um, learning discourses, um, acquiring vocabulary, becoming proficient in languages was shot through with difficulty um, and the process that he called ideological becoming. So I want to read you another passage, um, uh, this one illustrating the struggle that Vygotsky um, sees at the heart of learning languages. And this comes from, um, from page 77. As a living socio-ideological concrete thing, as heteroglot opinion, language for the individual consciousness lies on the borderland between oneself and the other. The word in language is half someone else's. It, become, it becomes one's own only when the speaker populates it with his own intentions, his own accent, when he appropriates the word adapting it to his own semantic and expressive intention. Prior to this moment of appropriation, the word does not exist in, some, in a neutral and impersonal language. It's not, uh, after all, out of a dictionary that a speaker gets his words. But rather, it exists in other people's mouths, in other people's contexts, serving other people's intentions. It is from there that one must take the word 
and make it one's own. Wow, I really like that passage. It, it um, I think, says something very important about how, um, how um, to really learn a language, to really participate in a, in a new social discourse. Um, we have to, in um, a very deep way, um, take the words, um, take the ways of being and behaving, and incorporate them into our own repertoire. And sometimes that's really difficult. Sometimes the words um, don't fit easily in our mouths, so to speak. Um, and it's this struggle, this, um, this important effort to learn another's language um, that I think we can think about in terms of the, the kids we work with and in terms of learning language and literacy and other semiotic systems. So one more word about, um, about this process of acquiring, acquiring um, a language or a discourse. Um, Bakhtin had a special term for it. He called it ideological becoming. And um, the way he thought about ideological becoming was that we're all bombarded with a lot of discourses, some of them very dominant discourses, um, that press upon us and ask us to accept the words and values associated with Bakhtin believed that you can separate yourself from those dominant discourses and find a way, in, in his words, to make others' words your own, to populate them with your own intentions, to accent them, uh, to animate them, so that you're not just dominated by the words of others. You're not just being um, suffused into another's discourse, but you're, you're um, coming into your own ideologically and you're finding ways to use others' words, but, to, but at the same time to use them for your own purposes, to make them your own, so that you're not, to use another of his words, ventriloquated by others' discourses. So keep in mind this notion of ideological becoming. I think it happens all throughout our lifetimes. For you as um, uh, university students now, it's probably a very important part of, of uh, your intellectual life to become a part of um, an academic discipline or profession or field and to uh, adopt its values, but also to shape them, to add your own spin to them, to add your own creativity. Um, and of course, it happens in other domains of life besides, besides the academic, too. All right, well, I hope that um, this uh, little mini lecture on uh, Bakhtin um, inspires you to um, think seriously about um, his ideas and perhaps to incorporate them as you begin to think about a case study at the end of the semester. And for the rest of the week, it might, it'll also be really fun for you to, to think about um, Bakhtin in the context of our own remix culture. Some of the readings that you had this week in the videos um, call attention to the ways in which, um, well, now we can remix anything um, not just words, but videos and music and photos and whatever, and we can distribute them globally. So think about how the notion of a remix culture could be connected to Bakhtin. Um, there's a way in which um, Bakhtin's um, theorization of language um, was, um, is very compatible with the idea of remix. Um, he thought about um, our taking words from others and shaping them to our own intentions. And that, of course, could be a, a, kind, of, a kind of remix. Bakhtin was thinking only about language. He wasn't thinking about videos or music or other semiotic forms. So it'll be interesting for you to consider uh, whether his ideas uh, are useful. I think they are, um, as we think about living um, in a remix age. A lot of the um, thinking about remix now um, seems not to not to consider so much the elements of struggle that were really at the heart of, of Bakhtin's theorization. So as you think about remix, um, I'd like for you to think about the ways in which the artifacts that we now remix um, need to be populated with our own intentions. Uh, in the same way that Bakhtin talked about um, dealing with language that way. And to what extent can we make images our own? So thank you for um, this moment to think with you about Bakhtin.